In this video, we are going to look at the Orthodox Study Bible, 1,822 pages. It's black letter edition. I'm going to take off this dust jacket because it's a wee bit noisy, and this is what it looks like. Now, this is a two-column edition. There's not a lot of marginal room. The study notes are at the bottom of the page. We'll talk about those in a minute. And there aren't any maps or charts or illustrations, but there are 12 full color, glossy thick paper depiction of icons sprinkled throughout the text. Now there are no cross references and the paper is really, really thin. The text isn't really lined up so that the white spaces between the lines on one side match the white spaces on the other side. Instead, they're a little bit staggered on a lot of the pages. So every page you're getting some ghosting where you can see what's printed on the other side because of how thin the paper is. Now that makes this a very thin study Bible in general, but just be aware, if you're gonna have one of these and take notes in it, I'd use a pencil or a color pencil. I wouldn't use anything liquid. Now at the beginning, there is a list of all the contributors and this was done primarily by St. Athanasius Academy and all of the contributors are archbishops, metropolitan bishops or fathers, priests within the Orthodox Church. Now for the text itself, the Old Testament was not translated from the Hebrew, it was translated from the Septuagint. From what I can tell in the introduction, they used primarily Rolf's Septuagint text in terms of the critical text that they worked from, and they leaned heavily on Brenton's English translation. And there's some notes about that in the beginning in the introduction. But basically, the Old Testament is translated from the Greek Old Testament, not from the Hebrew. So there are many places where the Old Testament reading in the Orthodox Study Bible is going to be different from what you find in almost any other study Bible on the market. It is working from the Septuagint. And there are differences in places in the Old Testament between the Hebrew text and the Septuagint in terms of where they break the chapters or where the verses are started. And when there is a difference in the Orthodox Study Bible, the Septuagint, the Greek version, is the primary numbering system. But then in parentheses, they'll put the traditional or the Hebrew chapter or verse numbers. You see this a lot in the Psalms. You also see it in books like Jeremiah or Malachi, where the Greek text of those books is different in terms of the order than it is in the Hebrew text. And at the beginning, there's a chart that lays out those differences for readers so you don't get too confused. Now, the New Testament is pretty much the New King James translation, which is based on the majority text. Now, if you saw our review here of the NKJV Study Bible, we go into a little more detail about that. So check that out for more. However, in the margins, they do note when the majority text, which the New King James is based on, and the Nestle Allen or the United Bible Society's critical Greek texts differ. So there are a lot of places throughout the New Testament where it will say M text, which is the majority text, or NU, Nestle Allen or United Bible Society. And that's nice. They're giving you text critical information between the different Greek manuscript families that the New Testament that we have is translated from. For the average reader, that probably won't make much of a difference, but for those of you that are Bible nerdy enough to follow and subscribe to Disciple Dojo, you may appreciate this. At the beginning introduction, it says that the notes and the material is intended to be at a level where a high school graduate could read and follow along. So not super scholarly, but they're also not dumbing anything down. So what are we gonna find when we crack this thing open and take a look? Well, at the beginning, you're gonna have a table of contents. There's an acknowledgments page, there's a special recognition page for some of the donors with deep pockets who helped underwrite this project. I don't think I've ever seen that in a study Bible. And then there's the introduction to the Orthodox Study Bible, which talks about what we just said, what text they're pulling from, the differences between the Septuagint, and then notes that explain what the study notes are going to focus on. And it's primarily four things that the Orthodox Study Bible wants to communicate. The Holy Trinity, the Incarnation, the centrality of the Church, and the virtues. And they also note that to attain these goals, specific attention was given to the biblical interpretations of the fathers of the ancient and undivided church and to the consensus of the seven ecumenical or church-wide councils of Christendom held from the fourth to eighth centuries. So you are getting primarily what the early 4th to 8th century Greek church fathers believed and taught and passed on during that period of the first seven ecumenical councils. There's also at the bottom of each page 
lectionary notes. So they tell you which verses are read on which days throughout the Greek Orthodox calendar year. After that, there's a comparison that shows the differences between the Orthodox Old Testament, Catholic Old Testament, and Protestant Old Testaments. So in the Orthodox Study Bible, in the Old Testament, not in a separate section called the Apocrypha, you're going to notice some differences. You don't have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. In the Orthodox Study Bible, you have First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kingdoms. So that's First and Second Samuel are First and Second Kingdoms. First and Second Kings are Third and Fourth Kingdoms. Then you have First and Second Ezra or 1st and 2nd Esdras, as they're called in Apocrypha collections. And 2nd Ezra is the equivalent of what we Protestants know of as the Book of Ezra. You also have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabees. And there's 151 Psalms, not 150. Then in the Wisdom sections, you have two books that are not included in Protestant Bibles. You have the Wisdom of Solomon and the Wisdom of Sirach. You also have two additions to Jeremiah, which is Baruch, and the letter of Jeremiah. In the book of Daniel, there are two chapters that aren't numbered, one at the beginning and one at the end. The beginning is the story of Susanna, and at the end is the story of Bell and the serpent. After this comes an overview of the books of the Bible. This was done by the Right Reverend Basil. Basil or Basil? Basil is what you cook with, isn't it? Basil is. Basil sounds nicer. I'm going to say Basil. He's the bishop of the diocese of Wichita and Mid America. And it walks through the different sections of the Bible. The Old Testament starts with the five books of the law, then the books of history, and those also include the books like Tobit and Judith. Then you have the books of wisdom, which again includes wisdom of Solomon, wisdom of Ben Sirach, and then you have the books of prophecy, and they are in a different order. The first of the prophets is Hosea, so the Orthodox Bible puts the what we call the minor prophets first, and Joel is also in a different place. Then it ends with what we would call the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then last, the book of Daniel. Then there's an overview of the New Testament book, which are all the same order. And then after that, you come to an introduction to the Orthodox Church. It's about eight pages, and it explains from the point of view of the Orthodox Church where they come from, their history. So it starts with the church in the New Testament and the early centuries and what the doctrines were and what worship looked like and church governance. There's a discussion of the offices of bishop, presbyter, and deacon. It talks about the seven ecumenical councils, gives you a little background on that. Then it talks about the disagreements that started to emerge between Christians in the east of the empire and Christians in the west, particularly Rome. And then in 1054, the Great Schism, where Rome and east parted ways. And it then goes on to note the different divisions in the West, where Rome and the Protestant reformers parted ways as well, and how the Orthodox were kind of observers to that whole thing going on in the West. And then lastly, there's a section about the Orthodox Church today. They say the people at Conciliar Press, and then they give the address for it, have volunteered to answer questions regarding the Orthodox Church from Orthodox Study Bible readers and to suggest further reading. Send your name and address with a request for information. So if you want to know more than this Disciple Dojo Review can give you about the Orthodox Study Bible right to the people at Conciliar Press. One thing that I thought was funny, throughout the Orthodox Study Bible, there's an emphasis on Greek, obviously, and the Greek text, not the Latin and not the Roman Catholic Church. And they, they kind of contrast themselves to the Roman Catholic Church, but the whole introduction is all Roman numerals. And the abbreviation for the Septuagint is LXX, Roman numerals. Apparently, they don't hate everything about Rome. Now, all of the book intros are about one page. That's about all you're getting. Very short. You are not getting commentary level book introductions by any means. You're really not even getting book introductions comparable to most other study Bibles. I was surprised at how short these introductions were. Really, really sparse. Now, there are sprinkled throughout the study Bible theological essays on different topics. But these are essays about what the church believes on various things. So on page two, there's an essay on creation. And one of the things that it notes is that the Orthodox Church does not take a dogmatic scientific view of creation interpretation. Regarding questions about the scientific accuracy of the Genesis account of creation and about various viewpoints concerning evolution, the Orthodox Church has not dogmatized any particular view. What is dogmatically proclaimed is that the one triune God created everything that exists and that man was created in a unique way and alone is made in the image and likeness of God. And then they note that the church fathers also consistently affirm that each species of the animate creation 
came into existence instantaneously at the command of God with its seed within itself. So they do tell you how the early pre-scientific age church fathers interpreted the creation account, but they note that the Orthodox Church as a whole does not demand or require any one particular view of how science and Genesis relate to each other. On page 7, there's one on ancestral sin, and it explains that unlike Roman Catholics and some Reformed versions of Protestantism, the Orthodox Church does not believe in what we would call original sin. And even after the fall, human nature is not inherently evil. And for some of you, this is borderline heresy, but it's important to know the early church fathers did not hold the same views on sin that came to dominate later Western Christendom. So in terms of what happened at the fall, they note we who are of Adam's race are not guilty because of Adam's sin, but because of our own sin. However, because all of mankind fell away from the grace of God through Adam's disobedience, man now has a propensity a disposition, an inclination towards sin. Because just as death entered the world through sin, now sin enters through fear of death. But they go on to note, the ancient fathers emphasized that the divine image in man has not been totally corrupted or obliterated. Human nature remains inherently good after the fall. Mankind is not totally depraved. People are still capable of doing good, although bondage to death and the influences of the devil can dull their perception of what is good and lead them into all kinds of evil. But ultimately, they believe Christ, by his death and resurrection, conquered the devil and death, freeing mankind from the fear of death and making possible a more complete communion between God and man than was ever possible before. This communion allows people to become partakers of the divine nature, to transcend death and ultimately all the consequences of the fall. So you can wrestle with that how you want, whatever your theology of the fall happens to be, but that's what you're going to find in here. Now, when we come to the end of the Bible, after Revelation, there are a couple of essays. One is called The Bible, God's Revelation to Man by Right Reverend Joseph, Bishop of Los Angeles in the West. And it's just a short overview of how the Orthodox Church views scripture. I did find one typo in here. It says, at the bottom of the page, heretics and unbelieving intellectuals may to read the words of scripture, but they cannot understand it, as does a spiritual man or woman within the holy community of the church. I think they left out the word try, may try to read the words of scripture, but they cannot understand it. I think, unless it's just some weird orthodox way of inferring a verb without saying it. Anyway, just a heads up in case anybody from St. Athanasius Academy is watching this. You got a typo on page 1754. After that, there's an essay called How to Read the Bible by the Right Reverend Callistas, Bishop of Diocleia. And this goes into a little more how to approach scripture on a practical level. It tries to hold the balance that scripture was written and should be read as God's letter and writing directly to me, each individual person, as well as the communal nature of scripture as God's writing to his people, and also emphasizing the historical nature of scripture as being written to certain people in certain times throughout human history in normal ways of speech. After that comes the lectionary, which lays out the whole Orthodox calendar year and what passages of scripture are taught on what day. And that's something that's totally foreign to most Protestants for non-denominational and Baptists and Pentecostals. They're just like, what? You just read what the Spirit tells you on whatever day. It's one of the big differences between those churches and churches that are of the Orthodox flavor. Then there's a glossary, including a lot of the terms found both scriptural terms and Orthodox terms. Then after the glossary, there are the Orthodox morning prayers and the evening prayers. Finally, we come to the index of the annotation. So all of the subjects discussed in the notes, then after that is the index to the study articles. So you're not just thumbing through randomly trying to find different essays. And then at the end on page 1822 is the 70. And I had to do some digging to find out what the 70 is. But the 70 are the 70 followers of Jesus. When Jesus sent out the 70, traditionally they are named and stories about them circulated throughout the early church and different dates came to be associated with celebrating the lives of these individuals from the early ministries of Jesus. So wherever they're mentioned, wherever these names pop up, it gives you the scripture, the New Testament reference, and then it tells you the day that they are commemorated on. 
Now, the study notes in Genesis, Exodus, Romans, Revelation, what we usually look at in these Bible reviews, for the most part, the notes are not exegetical notes. You're not getting very much of this is what this text says, or even this is what this text means. Most of the notes consist of this is what the church believes about, or this is what this church father said about this. So the notes are not necessarily a study of the biblical text, but rather, at least from what I gleaned looking through them this week, they are much more a study of what the church believes about doctrines and concepts from the biblical text. So here's an example, Genesis 3.8, where the man and woman heard the voice of the Lord in the garden. It says, Adam and Eve now had a fallen will and tried to hide from God. Fallen man now has a fallen will, thus he has a tendency to run away from God. But the grace of Christ heals the will of those who return to him through repentance so they might freely pursue God and do his will. So that's going beyond what the text is saying and telling you what the doctrine of the church is regarding human will, repentance coming to faith. And then again, in chapter 4, verse 1, where it talks about Adam knew his wife Eve, she conceived and bore a son. It says, Cain and Abel came into existence through God and through Adam and Eve. Each came into existence at the moment of conception. She conceived and was born nine months later. God brings every human being into existence in the womb of the mother at the moment of conception. His creative activity is simultaneous with conception. So they're using the passage about Adam and Eve having a child, conceiving and then bearing a child, as the jumping off point for telling you what the orthodox view of life coming into being is, which they take at the moment of conception. And of course, many, probably most Christians would agree with that, but most probably wouldn't use Genesis 4.1 as the basis of making that argument. So you're getting the theology of the church. You're also getting some tradition rather than some exegesis. So in 4.7, where Cain's offering is rejected, but Abel's is accepted, says, because the Lord loved Cain, he sought to bring him to repentance. He commended him for having the right worship, but reproved him for not having a right heart. And this comes from the Septuagint reading. Genesis 4.7 says, did you not sin even though you brought it rightly, but did not divide it rightly? Be still. His recourse shall be to you, and you shall rule over him. Now that's very different than how the text reads in Hebrew, and consequently how it reads in almost every English translation of Genesis as well, because they're all translating from the Hebrew. This is translating from the Septuagint and reflects a later interpretation of that passage that was enshrined by the Septuagint translators. So that's important to know. Sometimes in the Old Testament, the text itself is going to be different than what you read in any other study Bible that's based on the Hebrew text, and therefore the study notes to that text are going to be different than what you'd find in other study Bibles. Sometimes the study notes in pulling from the tradition of the early church fathers almost take on something of an allegory or a a wildly symbolic interpretation, which was common among some of the early church fathers. So for instance, in the Noah account, Genesis chapter 8, the study note at 8, 10, and 11 says, The dove foreshadowed the Holy Spirit, who caused the Holy Virgin to conceive Christ in her womb, and the olive leaf speaks of the Virgin herself. The olive leaf was also a token of men's reconciliation to God, and foreshadowed the fulfillment of grace in the holy mysteries, sacraments, of the church, service of baptism. Now that is how later church fathers looked back on the story of Noah and trying to discern elements or symbols that they thought were typological or had significance, but it's not in the text by any means. So just know that. This is what I mean when I say these study notes are telling you what the church believes about the passage rather than what the passage itself actually says. When we come to Exodus, again, a very brief, less than a one-page introduction, and there are no notes whatsoever on the history of the Exodus. There are no notes on the location of Sinai, no notes on which pharaoh was the pharaoh of the Exodus, was it the earlier dating, the later dating, literally nothing. Instead, you have, for the most part, the same type of notes you had in Genesis, how the church sees these passages. There was a weird note where Moses' mother ends up being the one that pharaoh daughter pays to nurse Moses. The note, it's odd. It just says, Jacobed may be the only woman in history to be paid for nursing her own child. Maybe. 
I mean, that's, I don't even understand the point of that note. There's nothing theological. There's nothing exegetical. It just struck me as odd. Now, while the study notes are really sparse, there are some interesting essays in Exodus. There's one on Christ, our Passover. There's one on page 90 that explains the grace of Christ and the law of Moses and talks about the harmony between law and grace as opposed to Catholic and other reform views where grace and law are seen as antithetical. Then on page 92, there's an interesting essay, Images and Imagery. Now, this is a round part of Exodus where you're getting into the Ten Commandments. And one of the commandments is you shall not make graven images. Well, if there's one thing Orthodox do, it's make images. So there's an essay here on how are the icons that the Orthodox Church uses and venerates, not idolatry. And here's how they explain it. So it's not the image itself which is faulty or prohibited, but rather it's improper use. The prohibition in Exodus 24 is not against all artistic representations. Rather, it's against images, whether in human form or not, which would be worshipped as gods and goddesses, gods of silver and gods of gold. For the Lord knew that such images would tempt the Hebrews to depart from worshipping him, the one true God. And they note, according to tradition, St. Luke the Evangelist made at least three icons of Christ and his mother. I've never heard that before. Interesting. I wonder what tradition that comes from. And then they say, the Seventh Ecumenical Council held in Nicaea in AD 787 condemned the heresy of iconoclasm, the rejection, even the destruction of icons. These holy fathers articulated the critical distinction between the worship reserved for God alone and the veneration, honor, reverence given to the icons. In addition, this council declared that the honor given to the image passes on to that which the image represents. So this is explaining the orthodox view of images and icons, and that's a big point of contention, especially for fundamentalists. They see icons, whether Catholic or orthodox, doesn't matter to them, and they just think idolatry. You're praying in front of an image, that's idolatry. So this is attempting to explain, well, no, this is why we don't consider it idolatry and what we think idolatry actually is. And to what degree you find this a convincing defense will depend on how you view the prohibition against idolatry in the first place. There's also another essay on page 101 that's worth reading, The Priesthood, Hebrew and Christian. And this explains why, even though the priesthood was an Old Testament institution, the Orthodox Church still has priests. And they sum up the view, the church retains the male priesthood because the man, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, officiates at every Eucharistic service in and through his bishops, priests, and deacons. The clergy do not serve in the place of Christ. Rather, Christ himself serves in them. If you are predisposed to thinking that priest is an okay, acceptable title for clergy in the New Testament era, then this will be a justification or a defense of that practice. If you oppose that, if you think priesthood should not be applied to anyone aside from Jesus in the new covenant, then you probably won't find this convincing. It'll depend on where you're coming from. Now, when we come to Romans, you get a one and a half page introduction, a fairly detailed outline of Romans, but you don't get, again, any history. You don't get any exegesis of the passage itself. What you're going to find is where the Orthodox Church differs from Catholic and Protestant churches in most of the notes. So the essays sprinkled throughout Romans, there's one, the basis of God's judgment. And that talks about how Orthodox view the question of how is God going to judge people in the end, including those who don't ever hear the gospel. Then there's an essay on page 1525 about the law and how Orthodoxy looks at the law and the different ways Paul uses the phrase law or namas to speak of different things. And this plays into the essay on page 1529 on justification by faith. This is probably the most pronounced difference between an Orthodox approach and both a Catholic and a Reformed Protestant approach. So they say, rather than justification as a legal acquittal before God, Orthodox believers see justification by faith as a covenant relationship with him centered in union with Christ. Orthodoxy emphasizes it is first God's mercy, not our faith, that saves us. It is God who initiates or makes the new covenant with us. And in contrast to some Reformed views, it says, but justification by faith alone brings up an objection. It contradicts scripture, which says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. James 2.24. We are justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, Romans 3.28. But nowhere does the Bible say we are justified by faith alone. On the contrary, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead, James 2.17. So, 
Orthodoxy tries to maintain what they see as the biblical balance between faith and works and to pull back some of the works righteousness tendencies that some Catholic traditions have ended up in, but also not go the route of the reformers who reacted so strongly against works righteousness that it became a faith and only faith with no works involved approach. The orthodox approach tries to be that middle ground that says, no, no, scripture upholds both and so should we. And I actually think they're right. And in the notes throughout Romans, you're going to find the orthodox views on things like the fall and salvation. So at 519 that talks about many were made sinners says refers to man's subjection to mortality and becoming prone to sin. It does not mean that man inherits the guilt of Adam's sin, nor does it mean that our sinning is completely inevitable. However, the first thing damaged in Adam's nature was his will, and in our corrupted state, this weakened will is prone to falling into sin. Therefore, many are made righteous and are able by grace to participate in God's righteousness. Indeed, many saints become so filled with grace that they pass extensive periods of time without sinning, for they allow the healing power of Christ to fill their human will. And that then bleeds into chapter 6 and how they view the concept of freedom from sin and being a slave to Christ and what role baptism plays in that, which is what you see discussed on page 1532, the essay on holy baptism. And they say, our relationship with God is not something static, a legal fiction given to us by a divine judge. Rather, this is a dynamic and real life in Christ holding the promise of everlasting life. And so they see baptism as not just a symbolic action, but actually entering into union with Christ. So therefore, the note at 612 says, while sin continues to plague humanity, those who are baptized into Christ have the power to overcome sin through their union with him. And 615, the law exhorted people to battle sin. The grace of baptism gives people the power to battle sin and win. This is where orthodoxy is very similar to what we find in different Wesleyan and holiness traditions and very different from what we find in various Reformed or Lutheran traditions. And when we get to Romans 7, the notes on who is the I of Romans 7 that Paul is talking about in the passage, they hold to, not surprisingly, the older view that the early church fathers like John Chrysostom and others picked up on in Paul's rhetoric, that Paul is not talking about in Romans 7, 14 and through 25, his ongoing everyday battle with sin as Paul the apostle, but rather Paul is presenting himself as the unregenerate, as the person who does not have union with Christ, as someone who does not have the spirit. So at 7, 17 it says, man is not sinful by nature. The Orthodox church rejects any teaching that man has a quote, sin nature, or that man's nature is depraved to the core. This passage clearly shows that sin is something distinct from our nature. Because we are created in the image of God, there is an indelible goodness in our nature that can never be undone. While we become immersed in sin, we know that it is still not part of our nature, but a foreign force that dwells within us. Thus, sin is what we do, not what we are. For some, this will elicit a hearty amen, and for others, this will be borderline blasphemy. But one thing that they don't do, which is unfortunate, they do not give the other views, the later Reformed views, and even the view that Augustine himself ended up coming to embrace, it would be helpful for them to acknowledge others don't read the text this way, here's what they think. To me, that's what a good study Bible should do on passages where Christians differ. So even though, I'll show my cards a little bit, I kind of lean more in the orthodox direction when it comes to Romans 7, especially that it's not Paul talking about his ongoing everyday life, I still think that they need to fairly present the other views that Christians have held going all the way back to the times of St. Augustine. Now, when we come to Romans 9 through 11, the notes having to do with election and predestination, there's pretty much nothing. Basically, it's summed up at the note in 9, 14 through 18. It says, even though mankind does not understand the basis of God's decisions, we trust his grace and righteousness upon which our salvation rests. Okay, but that doesn't help anybody work through what Paul's actually saying here. And in Romans 11, who is the all Israel? that Paul thinks will be saved, they take the approach that all Israel is Jew and Gentile together in the church, the one olive tree that's always been growing. They do not take the approach that all Israel refers to a future ingathering of ethnic Jews. 
Again, this is a passage that Christians are notoriously divided over in terms of how they interpret it, and it would have been nice for them to at least acknowledge that in this section. I kind of agree with the conclusion that they come to, but I don't think it was fair in how it was presented to those who disagree and hold to a different view. Now, let me take a second to talk about where this study Bible lands in terms of complementarianism and egalitarianism, the role of women in ministry. Obviously, the Orthodox Church does not ordain female priests, so they are operating from a a, what we would call a soft complementarian stance. And I say soft complementarian because just because they don't ordain women, it doesn't mean that they hold all of the views that traditional Protestant complementarians have put forth. So for instance, 1 Corinthians 14 about women should remain silent in churches. They say, an early tradition in the church is that women shall keep silent and not talk during the liturgy. While they are permitted to prophesy, they are not allowed to simply converse. With the spiritual gifts, all are equal in Christ, while the order of the original creation remains in the new creation. They're saying, Paul's not telling women they can't talk in terms of they have to be silent. He's saying, don't talk while the liturgy is going on. Don't just converse. Possibly, maybe, but why would he have not given that same direction to men? I mean, nobody should be just freely conversing during the liturgy. So it's it's kind of a weak note at that point. And you find something similar in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The infamous, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but let her learn in silence. The note here is just really weak. It says, the church's greatest saint is a woman, the Virgin Mary, mother of God. Some women, including Mary Magdalene, are called equal to the apostles. Others serve as deacons. While sharing full equality in Christ, women are not ordained to the office offices of bishop and presbyter. And that's it. It doesn't engage with anything that Paul just said in the passage. It just offers kind of a half-hearted defense of why, not even why, it just says we don't ordain women, but Mary was awesome. So it's unfortunate because I know that there are probably Orthodox theologians and interpreters that have exegeted these passages and that could say much more that your average reader would want to know when they turn to that passage and read it. So I think they dropped the ball there. Now, when we come Come to Revelation. This is an interesting one. The summary, not even a full page, and they advocate something of a multiple views at once approach. So they say, John's vision was first of all a reminder from God to the churches not to give in to their adversaries, but to hold fast to their faith. The book can also be seen as prophecy addressing a time far distant from its era of composition, predicting actual future events. Or as an exposition of the ongoing relationships and conflicts between God and his kingdom, humanity, and Satan. These three approaches are not contradictory, but complementary. All are valid. So they're doing something of kind of a hands-off approach of saying, look, there are different ways the book has been read and, and they're all valid. If you've seen our Revelation series here at Disciple Dojo, you know that I don't think they're all valid, but I do think there's truth in all of the approaches to varying degrees. So I would quibble with how they presented this to the readers, but they do at least note the different approaches. What was most interesting to me is the next paragraph. While seen as canonical and inspired by God, the Revelation is the only New Testament book not publicly read in the services of the Orthodox Church. That, to me, is tragic. Orthodox Church, you're missing out on the fifth gospel. Revelation, of all the books, was written to the churches to give them vision and hope and to shore up their faith. And that's one thing that every Christian all over the world needs in this world. However, they do give the reason for it. They say this is partly because the book was only gradually accepted as canonical in many parts of Christendom. In addition, in the second and third centuries, Revelation was widely twisted and sensationally misinterpreted, and the erroneous teachings brought troublesome confusion to Christians, a trend that continues to this day. I totally agree with that. There's a lot of garbage nonsense out there, and probably there's videos here on the side of your screen if you're watching this on YouTube where somebody's saying something crazy about Revelation. But that's no reason to avoid the book. Avoidance is not the cure for bad theology and bad interpretation. Good theology and good interpretation is the cure for it. Now, when we come to the church at Laodicea and the historical background, the Orthodox Study Bible gets it half right. They note that six miles from Laodicea, hot springs at Hierapolis gave forth water that became lukewarm by the time it reached Laodicea. It was contaminated with many minerals, impossible to drink, and nauseating. But they don't mention where the cold water came from, which was Colossae, and how that it was also good. They say the Laodiceans were lukewarm in spiritual fervor and good works. Their lack of commitment is revolting to the Lord who would have them go one way or the other. They don't give the other the cold, and how that's good. That's not bad. So 
ah, I can only give them a 50 on this section. But I do like the note at 4.1. It says, the after this, when John is taken up into heaven, does not refer to chronological order within the text of chapters 1 through 4, but instead connects this next sequence with the initial vision, a vision that beholds past, present, and future as one whole. St. John writes, as it were, from inside the eye of an apocalyptic tornado. That might be my professional wrestling name if I ever go that route, the apocalyptic tornado. Recording glimpses of the eschatological events that whirl by. So that actually is a helpful way of looking at it, that, that Revelation is not laying out a chronological timeline of events that you can chart out and therefore predict the future, but rather John is seeing these things flying by these images and how things go from earth to heaven, back to earth, back up to heaven. And then most interestingly, the notes in chapter 20, the millennium. Orthodoxy officially rejects a millennial reading of Revelation 20. They say, though most did not, a few early fathers and writers believed in a literal thousand year binding of Satan and reign of Christ and saints on the earth. That would be premillennialism. The church, however, authoritatively rejected this teaching called Kiliism at the Second Ecumenical Council. And so then they go on to explain how thousand years is an apocalyptic symbol and that it describes the church age. So if you want to know what a passage in the Bible is talking about or to study a book of the Bible in detail and understand the original text, I don't recommend this. You're not going to get a lot of help from the Orthodox Study Bible. But if you want to know how the Orthodox Church approaches this particular doctrine or this particular book or even this particular verse, that's where this would be helpful. And so for me, this will be a helpful shelf resource, but I would not recommend this as a primary study Bible. Honestly, even for Orthodox, I don't think I would recommend this as your primary study Bible. It's just not going to be helpful in helping you understand the text, but it will be helpful in helping you understand what they believe about the text. And a lot of what they believe about the text, even as non-Orthodox, I think they're right on about. Having a grasp of church history is helpful. And moving beyond just Catholicism versus Protestantism, which many of us Protestants are kind of conditioned to only see the two branches of Christianity, Catholic and Protestant. Well, no, there's an older one. It's not as widespread, but it goes back a lot further. It has deeper roots. So knowing about orthodoxy theologically is critical. And personally, as someone who is kind of Wesleyan evangelical, I think their views on holiness, sin, the fall, justification, the law, are actually more faithful to what we find in the whole of Scripture than in Catholic and later Reformed views. So like John Wesley, I appreciate a lot of the early church fathers from the Orthodox tradition. So this is a longer video than some of our other ones, but this was a study Bible that many people have asked me to review for over a year now, and I was glad to get the chance to finally do so. Hope it did it justice. If you are Orthodox, I would be interested to hear what you think about my non-Orthodox review of your Orthodox study Bible. Feel free to leave it in the comments below. Stay tuned for more Disciple Dojo study Bible reviews. Like, subscribe, share. All of those things are super helpful to grow this YouTube channel and to help us keep doing what we do here at Disciple Dojo. Mm -hmm.